engineering, bioengineering things are amazing. We hear a lot about these things today, that we, the human race, are playing and working and researching our genes. And uh, who knows after five years from now what will happen? Uh, 20 years ago, almost, we started the cloning thing. And uh, 20, 40 years before that, we had in vitro things. So things are happening so fast, and nobody can predict what will the end be. But today's session will be exploration and amazement and wonderland, if you like. Welcome to the first Eastern Illinois University Symposium on Science and Technology. And science and technology is our creation and the power that changes our lives at the same time. We all know that. Just look at people doing like this now. They didn't do that 20 years ago. But technologies that we create come back and influence the way we live, even the way we understand life. Without much ado, I introduce uh, our speaker to revolution. And that's exactly the theme of this symposium, revolutions in science and technology paradigms. And Dr. Stephen Daniels, the chair of physics department, my, and myself, have been working on this for some time now. And we want this first symposium not to be the last, but we want it to be a tradition from year to year. And maybe some of you, our future scientists and biologists and uh, thinkers and technologists would continue this tradition. I encourage you to take two copies of this, one of them to a friend, because this is almost the last week or the week before last for the symposium. So pick up whatever is left of these sessions and come. And one for your grandkids. So when you come home, coming 50 years later, and you look at Booth Library and they say, hey, my grandchildren, I have been part of this. And I hope some of you would do the second, the third, the tenth uh, symposium on science and technology. Without much ado, our esteemed uh, scientist, researcher, musician, filmmaker, producer, you name it. He is a multi-talented person. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Gary. Thank you, thank you. Good morning and thank you for coming. As you were sitting there, I was playing a song, and I was playing it for a reason. I don't know if anyone is, of you have ever heard this song. I remember hearing it when I was a child, and I thought it was really humorous. Uh, it was a hit in the 1940s, and the song is called, I'm My Own Grandpa. And it's funny because through a tangle of relationships, marriages, and children, this person who's singing the song actually argued su successfully that he was his own grandfather. So that's what was playing there. Had anybody heard that song before? Oh, a few of you. I guess it's still playing. 1940s hit. I wasn't born in the 1940s. I was born later. By the way. Oops. OK, so I think these are appropriate questions. <clears throat> Who am I? Where did I come from? This was a bestseller that posed this question. It was a bestseller for some years. And uh, of course, not so long ago, the answer to that question or similar questions was not that difficult. You could say, at least biological, biologically speaking, you could say, well, you know, I'm the product of my two parents. One is a woman. and. The other one's a man, and they're my biological parents, I'm their offspring, and, and that was that. Uh, you know, if you're answering that question from a biological point of view, those are my biological parents. All right, well, easy enough. But as you probably suspect, and as you probably know, things have gotten a little muddier, a little bit more tangled as to how you might answer that question. That's what this talk is about. And there's also uh, a question that I'll address just very briefly with one slide at the end. And that is, uh, what am I? Now, if I were to ask you, well, what are you? You might say, well, I'm a human. Or if you were a biology major, you might say, oh, well, I'm Homo sapiens, you know, genus, Homo, species, sapiens. OK. But even this might be somewhat of a problematic question, at least potentially in the future. I mean, we're not there yet with humans, but we certainly are with some other organisms. And I'll address that just at the very end of my uh, slide presentation. OK. so. 
This was uh, one of the advances in reproduction that you're all familiar with because it's quite common uh, today, and that's in vitro fertilization. With in vitro fertilization, that just means basically fertilization in a petri dish. So you take an egg from a donor, and uh, you fertilize it with sperm from whoever's going to be the sperm donor. It might be the father of the child, but it doesn't have to be. And the donor of the egg doesn't necessarily have to be the mother of the child in terms of rearing the child. Um, you know, it depends. There are various combinations as to who does what here. But the, but the point is, we got to the stage where we could fertilize eggs in vitro, in petri dishes, and then implant the embryo into a woman, whether it be a surrogate woman or the mother who's going to raise the child. So that's been around for quite a while. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Uh, it's relatively old technology. The first in vitro fertilized human was in 1978 in Great Britain. So here she is, front page news in some British newspaper, Louise Joy Brown. Here she is uh, years later, well today. There she is with her parents, and she now has her own child, not produced through in vitro fertilization. So it was, it was a success for this particular couple, and of course it made the news big time back then. Now in vitro fertilization, even though in humans it was 1978, before we had the first successful in vitro fertilization of humans, it's old technology. The first in vitro fertilization was done in rabbits. And that was in 1934, so well ahead of the 1978 extravaganza. But of course, since it involved humans in this case, this was relatively unknown, even though it was the same procedure. And the other one, of course, made headline news around the world. Now, so uh, where are we going? That's old technology. Done a lot around the world. Where are we going, or where do people fear we're going? Well, the clones. You know, the clones are coming, right? Or you hear talk about the clones are coming. So I put this word in there. The clones are coming. Sounds scary, right? Here's some clones from, I think, Star Wars. <laughs> I think these are banana clones right here, and there's some caps. So the clones are coming, but there's also this issue, and I don't know if you've heard of this as much, but the issue of virgin births. Clones and virgin births as two alternative ways for reproducing uh, humans. I mean, that's the big issue here. It's not so much that we do it or we see in other animals, but what we can do with humans, and humans don't normally clone, and what's this business about virgin births, too? So I'll be talking about both those categories, but first let me introduce cloning for those of you that aren't uh, some of my bio majors that I see here today, and then but uh, uh, sexual reproduction. So uh, we have two forms of reproduction, generally speaking. One is what we call cloning, and that is, well, I'll tell you off the bat, it is the most common form of reproduction for life on Earth. And the reason I can say that is most life forms are bacteria, single-celled organisms, and the way, the way they reproduce is by cloning. They basically copy their DNA identically, and then they split in half, fission they call it, binary fission, and then each one of those cells can then further split in half and you have clones. You know, they're all genetically identical, barring mutations. So, common as dirt, you could say. And then there's sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, by definition, it involves meiosis. So if you do meiosis, you're doing the sex thing. And meiosis is a particular way that a cell behaves and it scrambles up the genetic material it has and produces new combinations in the next generation, producing sex cells that in the future unite produce another stage of the organism of whatever species you're talking about. Of course, that's also common as dirt, as you know. So for those of you that are wondering, well, how common is common as dirt? Well, bacteria do cloning, right? So I have some bacteria here that are doing the binary fission thing right in front of you. And you're all familiar, certainly, with cloning in plants. Anyone that's gardened, or even if you haven't gardened, you probably know that for many plants, a lot of plants, you can take a stem, you can take a leaf, it depends on the species of plant. In this case, these are chickens and hens, I believe they're called, chicks and hens. And you can take a little cluster of the leaves and stick it on some moist soil, and it'll develop roots and turn into another separate independent plant. That's cloning. 
That does not involve meiosis. Those are simply the body cells of that plant that have been separated from the main part of that plant and reestablished somewhere else. Very common in plants, as you know. Uh, this is actually an animal. So it's not as if cloning only occurs in some plants or in bacteria. But it occurs in animals too. So this is a hydra. I know it looks sort of like a plant, but this little thing that's budding off the side of it can become a tap, detached rather, and form another individual just like this, but it is a clone. It's produced by basically cells dividing identically to form another separate entity, which we would call an individual hydra. So common in nature cloning. So what's the issue? If it's so common, why are we worried about cloning? Well, because we're talking about humans now. And do humans clone? Well, you don't think of my arm falling off and jumping away or crawling away across the table. It's like in that horror film, you know, where the, the hand goes killing everybody. I remember, remember the film, but uh, it's not going to sprout another individual, right? In fact, it, it won't go far as a hand. So uh, what about cloning in humans? Well, you already know, probably, that humans do clone. They clone, quote, naturally. They have been cloning themselves ever since there was something that we might call a human, right? And the um, kind of cloning I'm talking about are twins. They don't have to be twins. They could be triplets. They could be quadruplets, etc. So this is cloning just like in the sense of those other organisms that I showed you. These are not sex cells. These are body cells or somatic cells, as we call them in biology, uh, that have detached from an embryo that hasn't differentiated itself much yet. And if some cells get isolated from the other group, both groups of cells, or even two individual cells, can turn into two identical humans. And that's what happens when we have uh, 20. But, in humans, that kind of cloning, which just happens at a certain rate, um, is relatively rare, but it's only possible in this little window of time when you're in the first stages of embryogenesis, when you're just becoming an embryo. As the stages of embryogenesis go later and later in time, it becomes less and less possible for that to happen, for twinning to happen, or triplets, etc. But otherwise, it's the same thing. It's somatic cells, forming a completely new individual if you split them apart, right? So, cloning already happens. You know, where is the issue then? Cloning is already a, a, a natural, if you're concerned about that kind of work, a natural part of human reproduction. It's also old technology to clone animals, even, and I have two animals up here. This is a sea urchin, and that's a a salamander, cloning was already being done in the 1800s by taking sea urchin embryos and splitting it because they're fairly large embryos so they could split them up into subgroups of cells and they develop into independent sea urchins. That's cloning. The same is true with salamanders. This is the turn of the century. So over a hundred years ago people were cloning amphibians by taking embryos also and splitting them. At that time they were using human hair as their scissors to split embryos into sections of cells and then produce identical clones of salamanders. So that kind of cloning is old as, the, old as the hills and with animals. We don't do that deliberately, as far as I know, with human embryos. We could. You could take a human embryo and take a micro cutter, wouldn't be a human hair, we'd use something else, and divide it into separate cells and produce identical humans. I mean, that's possible. It would have been possible a very, very long time ago, that kind of cloning. So when people talk about cloning, and they have a worried look or a pensive look as to where it might go, they're not talking about this kind of cloning. That we can do, is done naturally, we can ramp it up if we want to, but I don't know if there's a necessity to do it. It's a different kind of cloning. But we still use that word, cloning. By the way, if anyone has any questions, while I'm talking, don't hesitate to stop and ask. So look, uh, uh, international Nobel Prize winners. Two of the Nobel Prize winners for 2012 were people involved in cloning, right, cloning cells. This fellow, John Gurton, was the first to clone an animal. 
1958. But then you might ask me, well, wait a minute. Didn't you just tell me they were cloning sea urchins in the 1800s? Yes, but this was cloning by a different technique. So when you read these kinds of things on the web, first person to clone an animal, you might get a little confused, but I thought it was 1800, this is 1958. No, what they're talking about is different techniques of cloning. So this was the first cloned animal, a frog, using the same technique that was used to make Dolly the sheep. In other words, you take an egg, you remove the nucleus of it, of a fertilized egg, and then you take the nucleus of a body cell of some frog and supplant it with the nucleus that you removed. So you put the DNA from a body cell into a fertilized egg, and then off it goes to produce a clone of the frog whose body cell you used. And it'll look identical to that frog. That kind of cloning had not been done until 1958, and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. All right? This fellow from Japan got the Nobel Prize for showing how you could take somatic cells and convert them into cells that have the potential to be any other kind of cell, even sex cells. So he worked with the proteins and the genes involved in switching cells to either go to sex cells or to be body cells. And he could take body cells and turn the clock back and make them able to then make choices about what kind of cell they're going to be. Because that's what happens when you're developing from an embryo. Your cells start to differentiate and start to take specific roles. But they all have the same DNA. They all have the same genes. It's just that they're being programmed differently. And if you could only take those cells back in time, right, from the cells that you already have programmed, and make them do other things, wow, wouldn't that offer you a lot of potential possibilities for manipulating for, in this example, reproduction. So that's why he got the Nobel Prize. This was just recent, last year, yeah. Would there be a potential to take like a female somatic cell and make a sperm, or a male somatic cell and make an egg? Yes, but that's at the end of my talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll say a little bit about that, but a uh, good point. In other words, I mean, here's a little window into the future. Any woman can be a man, and any man can be a woman in terms of producing sex cells. Potential, right? So, which role do you want to play? That's where we're going, or at least in terms of the possibilities of what we could do. Desirability is something else, of course, right? All right, so then you've probably heard about Dolly the Sheep. And why did Dolly the Sheep make news? It's not as if the technology was that new, because remember, it had already been done with the frog quite a time earlier. It's that it was a mammal. So it was the first cloned mammal. But remember, cloning by that special procedure that I just told you about, by taking a fertilized egg, removing its nucleus, and putting the cell of a somatic cell, a body cell, in its place, and therefore producing a clone. But, but keep this in mind, that kind of cloning requires sex cells. You have to use sex cells, fertilized eggs, in order to make a clone, right, of some individual cells, right? So that's why Dolly hit the news, 1996, Scott. Now, in case you're not familiar with the protocol or technique that I briefly mentioned, maybe this slide will help you. This is how they did Dolly. But this is also how they did the frog. So they took uh, one kind of sheep, Scottish blackface sheep, and they used that as the egg donor. And when it says enucleation here, what it means is they took the nucleus out of the egg of a sheep, and then they put in um, the uh, nucleus of a mammary cells of a different kind of sheep in its place. And they used a, a, a part of the way they activated the cell was to use an electric pulse. Not as easy as it sounds, though, here. Uh, they did um, almost 300 tries. In other words, they killed 300 of these kinds of eggs before they were successful with one. It was almost 300. And they got Dolly. And Dolly was a clone of that sheep, but used the egg of this sheep. So Dolly had two mothers, but no father. And two mothers genetically, too. And that's, that's how I mean it, actually. 
Uh, why do I say that? For the bio majors, why can I say that genetically this has two mothers? DNA comes from actually two mothers. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Because she'll get her mitochondria from the egg cell, or the original egg cell, not from the somatic cell that they took the nucleus from? Right. Yeah, he's absolutely right. So uh, we have two sources of DNA in our cells. Uh, most of your DNA is in the nucleus, but then you also have DNA in these little structures, we call them organelles, small organs. And they contain the little circles of DNA. That's, those are the mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA. So the mitochondrial DNA came from this sheep. This egg was floating with mitochondria, actually over a thousand. Uh, but the nucleus, which has most of the DNA, came from this other sheep. So you could say, genetically speaking, this sheep had two mothers. And obviously, two mothers were involved in other ways, too. The egg, even if it didn't have DNA in it, also came from another sheep. Now, it doesn't have to be a female over here. This could be a male sheep donating nuclear DNA, male sheep. And you put it into this egg, and then you'd get a clone of the male sheep. It'd be a male offspring, right? So it doesn't have to be another female. Oh, OK. So then there was Cumulina, the cute little cloned mouse, which I guess is getting a little favor. It looks like some, I don't know, that doesn't look like cheese practically. Some little treat. This was in 1997. So what, what's different about this? Why was this a big deal? It used the same technique, by the way, nucleus replacement, but it used a different set of cells. So the cells that they use to make cumulina are what, what are called cumulus cells, cumulus cells, like cumulus clouds, cumulus cells that surround developing eggs in mammals. They're like helper cells for a developing egg. And they took the nucleus of cumulus cells and put them into enucleated eggs. And the difference was when they used cumulus cells, they had a higher success rate. It was 50 to 1. They killed 50 to get one that worked. With Dali, they killed about almost 300 to get one to work. So they had a higher success rate. That was the only difference. You know, people trying to hone the technique to have higher success rates. OK, and since that time, the 1990s, uh, we've been successfully cloning by both the techniques that I'm talking about, nuclear replacement and also just taking embryos and splitting them into subsets of cells with a variety of mammals that we're interested that are domesticated animals. So now that's relatively old technology. Splitting embryos is very old, but nuclear replacement is, is becoming fairly commonplace with certain animals, breeding certain kinds of animals. Well, so how about cloning a human? There's the issue that would interest us the most, and maybe be the most problematic. Well, in 1997, one year after that cloning that I just showed you, a company started called CloneAid. And uh, CloneAid claimed on December 27th, 2002, coming around the corner, um, by the chief executive of CloneAid, who is a French woman called Brigitte Bosselier, she claimed that they had cloned a human in some secret location. I don't think it was legal in the U.S., and I don't think in Great Britain either, to do this kind of cloning. If I recall, but my memory might not serve me well, they did it in some island somewhere, I think over in Asia, and produced a clone that they decided to call Eve. So uh, who are these people that are supposedly, or they're claiming to do secret clones of humans and, and successful at it, because it was thought to be rather hard to do, and certainly you'd have a very high kill rate to do it for, for human embryos. You know, how, how did it happen? Well, it turns out these, uh, this particular group of people, the ones that funded clo CloneAid, and still do, CloneAid, as far as I know, still exists. Well, I know it does. Uh, are the Raelians. Does anybody know who the Raelians are? Has anybody heard of the Raelians? Rael? Nobody? Well, here are the Raelians. Let me just tell you something about them. 
The Raelians think that we came from aliens. I guess maybe it's similar to Scientologists, that we're inhabited by aliens that were seated on Earth. And we need to get back to our alien self in some way. I don't know all the particulars, but they're that kind of group. And so, you know, they do these little dress-ups when they're advertising themselves, little aliens. And here's Rael. That's where you get the name Raelians. And, uh, you know, he walks out of a uh, space you know, flying saucer and gives his presentations, etc. Now, they don't have a big following. But obviously, they do have some money. And to form uh, such a company that I told you about, uh, the only problem is they've never offered any proof to the world at large that they were successful at doing what they did. And they would not release the information as to who Eve was or release any DNA or anything that anyone could use to actually determine whether or not they did what they said they did. So at this point, as far as I know, nobody believes them. Nobody believed them back then. And as far as I know, nobody believes them to the present, that it was maybe an advertising spoof of some sort. But they've acted as if it did happen, you know, as far as I know to this day, uh, with all seriousness. All right, so, as far as I know, there are no such clones produced by that technique, right, nuclear replacement, walking on Earth. That doesn't mean the technology is impossible. If you can do it with sheep, which are relatively closer to us than frogs, if you can do it with a sheep, why can't you do it with a human? Of course. So theoretically, it should be possible. Well, look, in May of 2013, this year, a paper was published on human therapeutic cloning. So what's that about? It's the kind of cloning that we're talking about with Dolly the sheep. It's using the same technique as Dolly the sheep, taking eggs, enucleating them, and placing somatic cell nuclei in them instead. But they call it therapeutic cloning because the purpose of doing this kind of cloning with human cells was so we could produce stem cells or show that we could produce stem cells through the developing embryo from human cells, right, it's a developing embryo, that we could lead those embryonic cells down the pathway of stem cells for the production of different kinds of tissues and organs in humans. So it's been proposed as a technique for harvesting cells that you or somebody else might need during your life because something has gone wrong with the cells that you have, an organ or a particular kind of tissue. And that's why it's called therapeutic cloning. The purpose of this kind of cloning is not to produce a person, wherever that happens, at whatever stage that happens. The, the sole purpose, as it's been proposed at least, is to provide a, a system of tissues and organs, right? And I put this question up here, and this one, uh, you know, what's the status of these embryonic cells? Because as you know, in the literature, in the newspapers, etc., uh, some people are rather upset about using human embryos in research and having them die, you know, in research programs, etc. Some people consider that human embryos have the status of personhood, or they would like them to have the status of personhood, and legal rights, maybe as many rights as you have sitting here today, right? Some people would like a fertilized egg to have that status of personhood and certain legal rights. So then it begs the question, well, what about this? Because this embryonic group of cells was not produced by a sperm and an egg, it was produced by a somatic cell, nucleus, inserted into an egg that didn't have a nucleus. So is that the same kind of embryo? Does it have the same kind of status to those people that would make that argument? Well, I don't know. But I guess on the one side, the people that are doing this or proposing this are saying, no, this is a very different kind of embryo. It's made from just any old cell, so to speak. Those other ones, okay, if you want to give them special status because it involves a sperm and an egg. But in both cases, you produce an embryo. And in both cases, that embryo can develop into something that's sitting in front of you. It's less likely to happen for several reasons in this kind of cloning with human uh, body cells. But it doesn't mean it can't happen just like with Dolly the sheep. You know, there's some hurdles that you'd have to overcome to turn this cluster of cells into something that, uh, you know, that's walking the earth. And you would say, oh, that's a human. 
Okay. Now again, this is 2013, right? With human therapeutic cloning. Just one little step away from cloning a human like Dolly, which the Raelians claim they already have done, but nobody believes. Therapeutic cloning is also relatively old. It's just that it was done with mice first. Remember, this is after Dolly. So what they were trying to show with this kind of cloning, which was the same procedure as Dolly, was that you could take mice, do that procedure, and rear embryos from which you could harvest cells and then channel these cells into the development of different organs and tissues. And therefore, it's called therapeutic cloning, done in 2001, right? Just uh, over a decade before it was done in humans. So as you see, these things progress in steps. And we go through animal models first, and then finally apply them to humans. OK, so uh, let me change the topic a little bit. We're talking about cloning, two kinds of cloning, right? Splitting somatic cells, or using sex cells in conjunction with somatic cells, right? To produce clones. What about this business of virgin births, or other forms of you know, reproduction? Mm. Amanda was alluding to a second ago. Well, here's a virgin birth, right? Or a proposed virgin birth. So that's what we're talking about. We call virgin births. That is a female that's not been inseminated, it's not been fertilized, does not have sperm in her body. While giving birth to live young, we call that virgin birth or parthenogenesis. One way it can happen is that two eggs can fuse. In other words, a female might deposit two eggs in some part of her body, humans that'd be a uterus or a fallopian tubes, and then they fuse. Each egg has half the DNA that it needs to become the next generation, but it gets that other half from another egg with which it's fused, right? So now you have a full complement of DNA, and off it goes to be a virgin birth. No sperm was involved. Here's another way that it happens, that when Eggs are being produced through a process called meiosis. The chromosomes don't divide properly. And you might end up with an egg that instead of, instead of having half the DNA, has a full complement of DNA. Has all the DNA it needs for, let's say, a full-grown person or whatever the species is you're talking about. That's another way of permutation by which you could have virgin births. <coughs> so. Are virgin births common? I showed you that cloning was common in the world of life and even animals. What about virgin births? Here I just put up animals, just to show you that even in animals, virgin births are, are known. They're not that common, but they're known in a variety of different animals. So for example, this is a whiptail lizard from the southwest. There are six species that are that only reproduce parthenogenically by virgin births. And they only produce females. There are no males in these six species. No males, just females. They produce unfertilized eggs that become the next generation of females. Here's a Komodo lizard. Now, the Komodo lizard does have two sexes, males and females. They do reproduce mostly sexually, producing sex cells, etc. But they don't have to. So Komodo females can produce parthenogenic offspring. When they do, they're always male. They're only male, but they can do that. Same with boas. Boas have two sexes. But if you're a female and, the, and um, you're not successful at interacting with a male for whatever reasons, there's always the fallback position of parthenogenesis, producing baby snakes without having sperm from a male. Those baby snakes are also males. They're always males. Turkeys. Who knew that turkeys could reproduce parthenogenically? But they can. And in all three of these cases, the offspring are always male when they reproduce parthenogenically. Now, here's another animal. Uh, this is a bee. This is called the cape bee. It looks like a honeybee, but it's a different species. And the workers who have never mated with a male, they have uh, functioning ovaries, so they can lay eggs. But remember, they've never mated with a male. And in this particular species, these workers can lay eggs that develop either parthenogenically, either into males or females, both. So the rule I gave you here for these 
reptiles and this bird is not the same rule with these bees. They can produce both sexes parthenogenically. And they do. But there's also the queen bee, by the way, who is reproducing sexually. They do have their queen. And she has sperm, and she's producing most of what happens in the colony. And those are sexually reproduced bees. So actually, all three things are happening. Yeah? Maybe you're headed towards this, but if a male is XY, and a female is XX, if a male is XY, yeah, 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 yeah. and a female is XX, how does a female parthenogenically produce male offspring? Because in birds and reptiles, it's the opposite. It's the females that are XY, but we don't call it XY, we call it ZW. And so when they produce offspring, parthenogenically, they're going to be ZZs or WWs. And WWs don't live, only ZZs do. WW is a, is a combination, doesn't survive. Uh, so ZZs exist, but ZZs are males. So I don't know, if, did that make sense? Yep. And ZWs are females. So that's just the quirk of the sexing system. It's the opposite of us. So if Jesus was really born parthenogenically in the fashion that I'm arguing here, uh, Jesus would have been a girl. Because we have it. Jesus could not have been a boy, for example. Would have been a girl. Right? Which makes sense, you know. His mom only had X chromosomes. All right, so uh, this was in the news. I don't know if you caught it, but the, uh, a parthenogenic mammal had been born. That was a big deal, because we didn't think mammals could be parthenogenic, right? Didn't seem to be possible. Nobody knew of any cases of parthenogenic mammals. Uh, but yet Archie was born. So Archie's a cute little um, anteater, and the history of his birth is his mother had been mated to a male anteater. Uh, quite, a, quite a long time in the past, because she'd already had a birth by that male anteater. Once they were mated, they were separated. She got pregnant, she had the birth of not Archie, but Archie's brother or sister. And then the months passed and suddenly she got pregnant again. But she had not been with the male anteater since her first pregnancy. So then people thought, well, this is a case of parthenogenesis. You know, first case of parthenogenesis in mammals. You know, why? So that's why it was in the news. What they found though since, it was an embryonic diapause. And that refers to the fact that apparently with um, anteaters, uh, they can fertilize two eggs and then sequester one of the fertilized eggs and not have it develop. It's already been fertilized by, with sperm. And then sometime later, a long time later, suddenly that embryo is released and starts developing. So it wasn't really a, a, a parthenogenic anteater. It just appeared to be because we were ignorant about some of the ways that um, anteaters can reproduce. So that brings us to real parthenogenesis in mammals. But of course, now that it's humans manipulating it and making it possible. So virgin mammals, this is not so long ago, right? Just nine years ago. Fatherless mites. All right, so, you know, that, that's, that's a different answer to remember the first questions I posed on my first slide. Um, who am I? Well, now, in this case, they produce fatherless mites. You don't have a mother. You'd have a different answer, right, for that kind of question. So how are these fatherless mice produced? They were, they were produced by fusing two eggs, two mouse eggs, into one cell. The nucleus of two different mouse eggs into one cell, one nucleus. But to do that was not easy. And this is the reason why we think we don't see parthenogenic mammals. And that is, if a female fuses two of her eggs, or only has the DNA from her in this egg that might have the right quantity of DNA, that egg will not develop into an embryo. It'll die. It won't become attached to the, to the female and develop a placenta, umbilical cord, that whole thing. Nothing happens. And why is that? Well, they found out why that is. In mammals, there are genes that come only through the male, in other words, through the sperm, that are genetically imprinted now, if you don't know that term, what that means is that, well, I'll give you the specifics with mammals. Certain genes that come through the male that the female also has, you know, we share the same genes. Certain genes are turned off 
in the male set of chromosomes, but they're on in the female. And that combination is what the embryo needs to go to term. If you have two eggs fused, both sets of genes are on, and apparently that is not appropriate for proper development of the embryo. So you have to have certain genes off and some on, of the same set of genes. So that's the contribution of the sperm, to have its genes choreographed in a certain manner that allow the embryo to go to term. So that's one reason why we didn't think it was even possible for mammals to develop parthenogenically, because there was this male issue that had to be overcome. Well, once we understood that, of course not me, you know, them, uh, what they did was they were able to make the DNA from one of the two eggs that they were going to fuse to make it pattern the same way that a sperm would. In other words, they selectively went in there and programmed <coughs> the genes, turned them off, that they knew a sperm would have. And then they fused the eggs, and it worked. And they produced fatherless mice. And you know what? They were surprised, but it only boiled down to two genes. They only had to manipulate two genes in one of those two eggs to make it act as if it was like sperm. And then they took off and made fatherless mice. Well, <coughs> if you have fatherless mice, then uh, those mice are females, right? They're females. There's no Y chromosome there, because all mammals use X and Y system, like Dr. McGilliard was talking about. So they're all females. Uh, no males necessary here. So the guys in here might worry a little bit like, oh gosh, this is the future of my world here. Am I uh, expendable? So I would, do, I would go to great lengths to get on the roof, rake those leaves, take the garbage out, get under the car, change the oil, open those really hard to open cans and bottle caps. Make yourself useful, more useful than you've ever been. Because maybe they don't need us anymore. You, they could produce a race of Amazons, right? Nothing but women by this approach. And not only that, here's the kicker. You might say, well, I don't know, you know, they might still want to have us around as cute little toys or something, but uh, if we were all uh, females, it turns out, at least with these mice, they live 30% longer. They're healthier, live longer than if they had not been produced this way. It's not as they, you know, died early and for complications. No, they died a lot later. That would be like if, let's say, humans in the U.S. lived to be about 75 years. That'd be like you living on average about 110 or so. So some people would live to be maybe 130, <clears throat> some would less than 100, but the average about around 110. Wow, that's a lot of extra years. That's a lot of extra years. But of course, we'd all have to be girls. Right? We'd all have to be girls. <laughs> but apparently there's some benefits. Okay, so um, can infertile men and women produce children without cloning, right? You could always clone yourself, right? If cloning was legal, you'd say, oh, you know, I want to reproduce, but I'm, I don't have any sperm. Let's say you're a guy, I don't have sperm, and I want to reproduce something that has some of me, some of my DNA. Well, I guess I don't have any options, I'll clone myself. You know, if that was an option, I don't know any place that clones humans yet, but. Let's say it's an option. Then you take one of your cells and produce another you. I don't know what you want to call it, your twin, your son, if it's a guy. But anyway, you produced another thing that looks just like you, for the most part, right? But this is what Amanda was bringing up. What they've been able to do is um, get embryonic cells to produce uh, either sperm or eggs. And it doesn't matter whether the embryonic cells that they're producing come from a man or from a woman. They can coax those embryonic cells to make either sperm or eggs, regardless of the source of the original cells. So how do they do that? Well, remember that therapeutic cloning, right, the therapeutic cloning? You could take the nucleus from thera therapeutic cloning and put it into an egg and make embryonic cells. Um, and they would be sex cells of whichever choice you wanted. 
Or there's another technique now uh, that's a little different idea, and that is where they take cells from the body, they remove half the DNA, and they use that as if it was a sex cell to complement what's missing from the other sex cell. In this case, it would be an egg. Right? So they make body cells haploid. That's another way. Um, but anyway, this is directly referring to making sex cells of either kind, whether you're a man or a woman. So if you're sterile and you want to play the role of a female, you could get these primordial cells to turn into eggs, primordial sex cells, or you could get them to turn into sperm. And then depending on what gender you think you are, or what gender you think you like, you know, you could make reproductive choices about which role you want to play. And that again sort of makes another tangle when you're the offspring of these choices as to who exactly are you, right, with all the options that are available or potentially available. No one's doing this sort of thing now that I'm aware of. Or, you know, you could be just completely confused and just not know where you sit. You're on the fence as to what the choices are. I guess you could say one thing, that perhaps, perhaps in your futures, what will be different for you than it is for me will be that you, have, you will have choices that I didn't have, for good or for bad. And then once you have choices, then you're responsible. You'll have another level of responsibility for making those decisions. If you don't make them, there could be a cost because you could have, and you have to suffer the consequences of either way. If you choose black or white, it doesn't matter, but you'll have to make choices. Whereas in my generation, things just happened and it wasn't anybody's fault, just the way things were. So that's also a different kind of world. Now if I can find my mouse. Okay, how about three biological parents? Is that possible? Well, it was just done last summer in England. Three biological parents. Now I don't know if you guys know this. Does anybody watch Three's Company? Three's Company? Yeah, it's an old program, I think, from the 70s maybe 60s or 70s. Uh, they were unmarried, they lived together. Uh, people thought, oh, maybe they're doing, you know, it was very clean cut, they were friends. Anyway, and so here's the baby going, oh my God, you know, I've got three parents, and I'm talking biological parents. So what is this particular case about? Again, if you were to ask, well, who are your biological parents? Oh, I have two moms and a dad, biologically speaking. Well, uh, let's pretend she, had mutations in her mitochondria that made it unwise for her to have children because of the kind of mitochondria she had, right? And her mitochondria are okay. And then, of course, he's got sperm and he's okay, all right? So uh, you probably see what's coming then. So we take the nucleus out of one of her eggs, because remember, she's the one that has the mitochondrial problem and stick that nucleus into one of her eggs. So now you already have two mothers. One mother is giving you the nucleus, and the other mother is giving you the mitochondria, and then you fertilize that egg with his sperm, and you have three parents. And the first case of that, which was okayed legally, so to speak, was this past summer in Great Britain. Now, how many of you have heard of embryos being implanted in men so that men could get pregnant? You, you open up their body cavity, you implant the embryo, the embryo develops a placenta-like connection to a bowel or some other part of the internal anatomy of a male, and then males de uh, develop the uh, fetus, and then they get birthed by, um, by cesarean. How many of you heard of that? You heard of that, right? Was it in the news, or where did you hear about that? And what did you think at the time? Not to put you on the spot here, but <laughs> um, I thought it was rather strange, because I saw it in the news too. And here's Time Magazine, here's Newsweek, man of the year, uh, Mr. Lee's pregnant. Well, I didn't know at the time, but I found out it was all a big spoof. spoof. It's an urban legend. Never happened, didn't happen, nobody thinks it's particularly possible. It might be, but you know, you run the risk of killing the, the father-mother, 
uh, because of the way the thing's going to attach. That, you know, that's why women die from ectopic pregnancies, because the eggs didn't, or the embryo didn't attach in the uterus, it attached in the fallopian tube. You have the same organic problems. And he never did get pregnant. In fact, this is a fake Time magazine. This is a fake Newsweek. I mean, he put these together and spread them out there to make people believe it was news. <clears throat> but it was all propaganda for his artist's endeavors. He was an artist. And he was trying to... He was doing this as an exercise in expression, by the way. This was his art. Okay? But uh, <clears throat> was there another case when she, he was she before and make transfer transfer to a um, woman? Yeah, now you're talking about another case where a man got pregnant. And this was a real case. So here he is. Here's his wife, and he's pregnant. Now, and this isn't a spoof. And there they are. Um, she was born. I don't know if it was cesarean or not. Uh, so what's that about? What happened? Does anybody know? This particular, Elizabeth? Um, there was a sex change earlier before the Yeah. Uh, he used to be a woman. And here he is. He used to be Tracy Lagundino. And then he became Thomas Beatty. And he married a woman. But the thing about Thomas Beatty was that he wasn't completely sex changed. He'd left the bottom part unchanged. So he had ovaries. He had uterus, etc. He had all the parts of the woman, but he was already hormonally ch uh, changed and he'd had his breasts removed. So when he married this woman who could not give birth to children, they decided that then he would be the one that would get pregnant. So was it a man getting pregnant or not? I, I don't know how you want to call that. It was sort of a bit of both, but anyway that explains why it was possible. Otherwise nobody thinks it would be a particularly good idea. And they've had three children now. All those children were born from him. Him, her, or whatever you want. So, <coughs> here's, here we are back to that first slide, and I put this, what am I? What time is it, by the way? I don't have a clock. 7-2. Okay, well, very quickly, and I only have one slide. It was, what am I? And the only reason I put this one up is because uh, we're going great guns in bioengineering in terms of putting DNA of different species mixed with other species in all sorts of ways, like a major percentage of the corn grown here in the, in the Midwest has uh, bacterial genes inserted into them to make them pesticide resistant. Uh, here's tobacco. I remember seeing this when I was in school. They made tobacco glow in the dark by inserting lightning bug genes into the plant cells. And here's a luminescent fish that you've probably seen maybe in Walmart. And they have fluorescent jellyfish genes in them, as do these pigs, so here's a mammal, with fluorescent jellyfish genes. So that kind of technology is also developing with everything else you've seen about how you might be able to reproduce and also add genetic material from who knows where for what kind of purpose, and then you become a chimera or sort of a mix of DNA from a variety of things, potentially, and uh, from a variety of different kinds of parenting, and then, so what are you and who, you, who are you? It doesn't give an easy answer. It would have to be sort of complicated to say, hey, why don't we go have a drink somewhere and I'll tell you. <laughs> we'll sit down and give me a few minutes to explain my ancestry to you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Very good. say, well, I'm a human. Or if you were a biology major, you might say, oh, well, I'm homo sapiens, you know, genus homo species sapiens. Okay. But even this might be somewhat of a problematic question, at least potentially in the future. I mean, we're not there yet with humans, but we certainly are with some other organisms. And I'll address that just at the very end of my uh, slide presentation. Okay, so this was uh, one of the advances in reproduction that you're all familiar with because it's quite common uh, today, and that's in vitro fertilization. With in vitro fertilization, that just means basically fertilization in a petri dish. So you take an egg from a donor, and uh, you fertilize it with sperm from whoever's going to be the sperm donor. It might be the father of the child, but it doesn't have to be. And the donor of the egg doesn't necessarily have to be the mother of the child in terms of rearing the child, 
Um, you know, it depends. There are various combinations as to who does what here. But the, but the point is, we got to the stage where we could fertilize eggs in vitro, in petri dishes, and then implant the embryo into a woman, whether it be a surrogate woman or the mother who's going to raise the child. So that's been around for quite a while. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Uh, it's relatively old technology. The first in vitro fertilized human was in 1978 in Great Britain. So here she is, front page news in some British newspaper, Louise Joy Brown. And it's funny because through a tangle of relationships, marriages, and children, this person who's singing the song actually argued su successfully that he was his own grandfather. So that's what was playing there. Did anybody heard that song before? Oh, a few of you. I guess it's still playing. 1940s hit. I wasn't born in the 1940s. I was born later. By the way. Oops. Okay, so I think these are appropriate questions. <clears throat> Who am I? Where did I come from? This was a bestseller that posed this question. It was a bestseller for some years. And uh, of course, not so long ago, the answer to that question or similar questions was not that difficult. You could say, at least biological, biologically speaking, you could say, well, you know, I'm the product of my two parents. One is a woman and the other one's a man. And they're my biological parents. I'm their offspring. And, and that was that. Uh, you know, if you're answering that question from a biological point of view, those are my biological parents. All right, well, easy enough. But as you probably suspect, and as you probably know, things have gotten a little muddy or a little bit more tangled as to how you might answer that question. That's what this talk is about. And there's also uh, a question that I'll address just very briefly with one slide at the end. And that is, uh, what am I? Now, if I were to ask you, well, what are exactly the theme of this symposium, revolutions in science and technology paradigms. And Dr. Stephen Daniels, the chair of physics department, my, and myself, I've been working on this for some time now, and we want this first symposium not to be the last, but we want it to be a tradition from year to year, and maybe some of you, our future scientists and biologists and uh, thinkers and technologists, would continue this tradition. I encourage you to take two copies of this, one of them to a friend, because this is almost the last week or a week before last for the symposium, so pick up whatever is left of these sessions and come and one for your grandkids. So when you come home, coming 50 years later, and you look at Booth Library and they say, hey, my grandchildren, I have been part of this. And I hope some of you would do the second, the third, the tenth uh, symposium on science and technology. Without much ado, our esteemed uh, scientist, researcher, musician, filmmaker, producer, you name it. He is a multi-talented person. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Gary. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for coming. As you were sitting there, I was playing a song, and I was playing it for a reason. I don't know if anyone of you have ever heard this song. I remember hearing it when I was a child, and I thought it was really humorous. Uh, it was a hit in the 1940s, and the song is called, I'm My Own Grandpa. Bioengineering things are amazing. We hear a lot about these things today. That we, the human race, are playing and working and researching our genes. And uh, who knows after five years from now what will happen? Uh, 20 years ago, almost, we started the cloning thing. And uh, 20, 40 years before that, we had in vitro things. So things are happening so fast and nobody can predict what will the end be. But today's session will be exploration and amazement and wonderland, if you like. 
Welcome to the first Eastern Illinois University Symposium on Science and Technology. And science and technology is our creation and the power that changes our lives at the same time. We all know that. Just look at people doing like this now. They didn't do that 20 years ago. But technologies that we create come back and influence the way we live, even the way we understand life. Without much ado, I introduce uh, our speaker to a revolution, and that's exactly Here she is uh, years later, well today. There she is with her parents, and she now has her own child, not produced through in vitro fertilization. So it was, it was a success for this particular couple, and of course it made the news big time back then. Now in vitro fertilization, even though in humans it was 1978, before we had the first successful in vitro fertilization of humans, it's old technology. The first in vitro fertilization was done in rabbits, and that was in 1934, so well ahead of the 1978 extravaganza. But of course, since it involved humans in this case, this was relatively unknown, even though it was the same procedure. And the other one, of course, made headline news around the world. Now, so, uh, where are we going? That's old technology. Done a lot around the world. Where are we going, or where do people fear we're going? Well, the clones. You know, the clones are coming, right? Or you hear talk about the clones are coming. So I put this word in there. The clones are coming. Sounds scary, right? Here's some clones, I think, Star Wars. <laughs> I think these are banana clones right here, and there's some caps. So the clones are coming, but there's also this issue, and I don't know if you've heard of this as much, but the issue of virgin births, clones and virgin births, as two alternative ways for reproducing uh, humans. I mean, that's the big issue here. It's not so much that we do it or we see 